The other great example is the cheetah. And cheetah are beautiful creatures. They're, they're cheetahs in the Bronx Zoo. They're cheetahs in lots of places. If you were a predator, this is what you'd want to be. Slender, the, ostensibly the fastest creature on Earth, with teeth and claws. And they actually turned out to be very agile. That's only recently learned that they're very agile. But there's a cost to speed. And the cost is, a sports physiologists, stamina. They're not, they, they run out of gas more quickly. And the creatures that they eat tend to evolve little strategies, I mean, this is more conjecture than anything else, to buy themselves time so they can outrun the cheetah. So if we, if we take these considerations to the humans, we realize there's just so many different situations we're confronted with that it, would make sense, it wouldn't make sense that one kind of regulatory behavior would always be adaptive and, and wouldn't have any cost, that others would always be costly. There's got to be lots of variation across stresses. So this is the model we came up with. And this is really more of a way to integrate the research that we and other people have been doing and move forward. It's a very basic model. Um, so we have a stressor, this lightning bolt, a major stressor. And we have to evaluate the demands and opportunities. We have to ask ourselves, what is happening to me? What do I need to do? And we probably do this without thinking. This is probably a kind of an implicit or unconscious evaluation. And we use this information downstream to select a regulatory strategy. So this is really important information. But there are individual differences that we can measure in the sensitivity to context. So some people are simply more sensitive to events that happen to them and to what the implications are for their behavior than others. And this is measurable. But, and as I said, this information is important because it feeds downstream. And then we select a regulatory strategy, again, probably without thinking. Not only do we, do we try to select a strategy that meets the demands, we have to ask ourselves, what am I able to do? And this fits, I think, nicely with the things Bruce brought up yesterday. Was it yesterday? Yesterday, about um, the fact that um, some, some adversities will cause behavioral propensities that might be very adaptive in some contexts, but there may be things that same child won't be able to do in other contexts. So the repertoire, the individual differences in what people can do is hugely important. And most theories of coping and emo emotional regulation stop there. And we've been arguing that there's another stage that's really important, which is that in the real world, we monitor what we're doing, and we sometimes modify it. So we take feedback about, and we ask ourselves, is this actually working? And we use that feedback. Then, and again, there are individual differences that we can, we've been measuring in the propensity and the ability to use that feedback and to maintain what we're doing or, or adapt it or maybe select a new strategy. Or maybe we're, the feedback is saying, this is just not working. You don't know what's happening. And you have to re-examine the situation. And for longer term situations, we do this repeatedly over time. So there's lots of data accruing um, from laboratory and self-report measures for these different dimensions. I want to tell you um, a little bit about the, um, the, some of the measures. Early on, we developed something called expressive flexibility. And this was based on the idea it was assumed that expressing emotion is good and suppressing emotion is not good. But we'd argued that expressing or suppressing are less important than the ability to do those different things in different contexts. So the, the ability to use either one of those behaviors is more important. So we came up with this measure. Um, we have people um, looking at pictures and rating their experience and, and monitoring their emotions. And then they're told somebody's viewing them on a monitor in another room. And every person got, in different orders, different conditions. One was to enhance and be really expressive. Another condition was to suppress and not show any emotion. And another condition was to view the, the situation normally. Um, then we actually code the facial expressions. And we use these data because everybody has all the measures. We create uh, ability scores. How much can the person ramp up or ramp down relative to their own control? And I'll just, I I'm, I'm seem to be running out of time, so I'll just tell you very quickly that this predicted long-term adjustment after 9-11. This was controlling for adjustments. So we looked at, at students who were exposed in New York and we found that it both enhancing and suppressing ability predicted long-term adjustment, as did a flexibility score. But what's really significant here is that the difference between the two did not predict adjustment. That means being good at one of these behaviors without the other wasn't very adaptive. Now, it wasn't maladaptive. It didn't predict a negative adjustment. It just didn't predict adjustment. Um, this is, we've used this in many different studies, predicting the trajectories. Um, it, it seems to be a similar build ability in older, younger adults. And it's surprisingly reliable over time. We've actually had people do the experiment um, several times, and we found the same effects. I'm going to skip this slide. That just shows it, it's associated with psychopathology. 
Um, I'm going to skip this slide, too. This is really just about coping flexibility. We have measures of coping flexibility, and these are studies of, uh, this was a study of uh, Israelis exposed to terrorist violence. People who were low on flexibility had more post-traumatic stress and had a greater reactivity to, to, to greater exposure. People who were high on flexibility had less post-traumatic stress and didn't increase in post-traumatic stress symptoms uh, with higher levels of exposure. And recently, this was replicated in South Korea um, the exact same findings in South Korea. The high flexibility people had less PTSD symptoms and at greater levels of trauma exposure, uh, no change. So just I'll close by just telling you about some of the new things we're doing and how this fits. Um, we're measuring context sensitivity in some new ways. We've come up with a questionnaire measure of expressive flexibility. We've been able to predict the experiment, which is something that isn't typically done. And we are, that it's not something people are typically able to do. And we have an affective flexibility paradigm, which is the same instructions, only that in this case, the instructions are to feel more and feel less. And we, the, the question we've struggled with for years was how do you do that? Because you can't ask people to feel more and feel less and then ask them if they felt more and feel less and felt less. So we, de we decided we could use the corrugator muscle. And that's this little muscle right up there above the eyebrow. And the corrugator muscle uh, for facial EMG is the corrugator muscle is involved in almost all negative emotions. It's a very active little muscle. Take a look at your corrugator muscle sometime. Um, but it turns out if you use an, an, an EMG electrode that it's very sensitive even when people keep their face completely flaccid. And it also doesn't seem to be affected by whether people know the hypotheses or not. Because it's not measuring expression. It's measuring the, the internal affect, it seems. And it's very sensitive in that way. And just to. Um, show you this really quickly. Um, Jenny's telling me I have one minute. Is that really right, one it's minute? It's not, but you can add it more. <laughs> it's not. Um, that's interesting. <laughs> um, this just shows you we were able to get the same kind of variability with the affective regulation. And, and we're now doing this in a lot of different studies. Um, and it correlates with the expressive flexibility. Depressed people don't do it very well. And it turns out that people get better over time. We did one study where we did it for a long period of time, and people get better and better in their performance, except depressed people. So depressed people were not able to learn. Um, oh, this, well, this is the feedback paradigm. So I just want to tell you, I won't, won't tell you the details of this, but basically what, what this data shows is that we have people regulating their emotion, and then another version of the task, we tell them at four seconds they hear a tone and the four seconds, they, when they hear that tone, they can opt out of the strategy we gave them to use. And they can push a button, and these distractors will appear. So they can then use the distractors to keep their mind off the aversive picture. And what we wanted to find out and what we did find was that people who, used, who did that in accordance with what their body was doing, we were measuring heart rate and the corrugator and also self-report. We had skin conductance, but skin conductance didn't do anything. But when they, when they made those switches in accordance with their body, um, that predicted well-being. So the people who were better off or fun functioning better were also more able to do this, and the people at lower well-being were switching more randomly. So that was a measure of feedback. Now, I just want to finish with this little idea. Um, so this is this multidimensional construct, regulatory flexibility. And we, we've got pretty good data now that suggests that it, this is really a moderator between a, acute stressors and resilient outcomes. But a lot of the ideas that, we've, that are in the literature on early life adversity suggest that early life adversity probably impacts on this variable. And this may be one of the ways you get these, these distal outcomes, um, because early life adversity may make people less flexible. And, I, and um, Ryan had uh, mentioned this yesterday, and this is one of my favorite studies, my colleague at Columbia, Nim Tottingham's work, and also Regina Sullivan, who's done this with rodents, and um, somebody's done it with chickens. No, nobody researches chickens. Um, <laughs> monkeys, monkeys, oh, monkeys. monkeys. Um, I, I think it was somebody at Emory, I don't remember, um, who was doing the work with monkeys. But across all of these species, in adolescence is when you really get the kind of adult connectivity from the ventromedial prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. Not to it, but from it. And so it's really when adolescents begin to self-regulate in a big way. And um, kids who are neglected, I mentioned this the other day, kids who are neglected show precocious connectivity, but probably 
at the cost of being less flexible. And the, the researcher, would, um, I'm blanking on her name, I apologize for that, the, who does the monkey research, called them little go, no go kids. Because their switch kind of gets thrown rapidly, but then they can't undo the switch. So they're not very nuanced in throwing that switch. And that suggests inflexibility. So I think that this is a really important avenue for future research. And one of the questions it raises, maybe can you just make people more flexible? Will that, will that be, is that possible? And would that be enormously adaptive? And we've done a few studies now with adults where we've shown in very simple ways you can make people more flexible. In one study, we used a Carol Dweck kind of paradigm where we just told people, we lied to people and just said, the research shows that, that you can really get good at this very quickly. And they did. They, they, got re they improved a great deal. And we told another group that this is fixed. It's, it, the, a new study shows that this is a fixed behavior. And they didn't improve over time. So there may be simple things like that that we can do. But I'm, I'm out of time now. And thank you for letting me have a little bit more time. Thank you. So since Ann didn't get a question, uh, we're going to save the questions until after Steve. I uh, okay. hope that's OK. Of course. Uh, so as uh, just one reminder, the phone number up there to text questions or hand your <coughs> question to Carlo and Erica there so we can compile them. Uh, just as Steve walks up and gets his, his uh, slides up, just let me say a few, um, a few things about Steve Sumi. So Steve really comes to us. This is a very unique opportunity. Uh, he, he doesn't get a chance to do these things as often as he wants, and it's just a real kind of coincidence yeah. that he's here. He on. will tell you that he invited himself, but that was a strategic ploy on my part to catch him at dinner right before he got his wine. Um, Steve is the chief of the Laboratory of Comparative Ethology at NICHD. He is the primate monkey guy. And he's been there for years and years. And what you have to understand about Steve is that he introduced this idea that damage, as we think of brain damage and damage due to stress and other adversity, we shouldn't always think about this as permanent. And he was talking about this uh, when, even when he was doing his, pre, his doctoral work and his postdoctoral work. And Steve is part of this really cool uh, consortium that was spearheaded by Liz Nielsen at the NIA, the Aging Institute. It's called the Re Reversibility Network. It's a US-UK network. And one of the things they're doing is promoting science of resilience. And uh, they've done an RFA recently where they are looking at long-term longitudinal studies of early adversity and how these people are aging through midlife and how we might think about midlife as a, a point of particular malleability where reversibility paradigms could be enacted in these creative interventions, promoting reversibility in midlife. So you have to understand how unique this network is and what a sort of a paradigm shift it is for our entire field, especially when we think about brain damage and brain development. It's not always productive to think about it as damage, but rather where are the malleable points and the optimal windows to think about reversibility. So that's a long introduction just while Steve's getting his slides up, but thank you so much. And don't forget your questions go to these people over here. Thank you. So thank you for that nice introduction, and thank you for allowing me to invite myself to this wonderful meeting. Um, I've only been here for half of it. I had meetings, uh, planning meetings at NIH yesterday, and so I missed what I understand was a fabulous first day. But I did get dinner, and that was pretty good. So I want to tell you a little bit about the work my colleagues and I at the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development have been doing over the last few years as it pertains to the topic of this conference. And my lab, which focuses on rhesus monkeys, not humans, has, since its, its inception, had a primary interest in understanding and characterizing individual differences in personality or temperament in the monkey colony ma we maintain in the lab and the biological substrates that underline those individual differences and how genetic and environmental factors act, and we think much more importantly, actually interact to shape individual developmental trajectories. My lab is not on the main NIH campus in Bethesda, but rather it's out in the Maryland countryside near a little town called Poolsville, 
So when I talk about the Poolsville colony, that's what I'm referring to. And it's fairly, it's about 30 miles up the Potomac River from downtown DC. Here's the Potomac River, that's Virginia over there. Look at all the suburban sprawl on that side. Here's the Maryland side, and you see nothing but green. That's what good zoning laws can do. The outlined area in yellow is the National Institutes of Health Animal Center. It's about a square mile on each, a mile on each side. And in the red section is my lab, where we measure our lab space in terms of acres rather than square feet. And in the lab, on the part of the lab, is a five acre field enclosure uh, with a shelter, a pond where the monkeys can go swimming, a little island they can go and jump out of the trees into the water. Um, when we have an occasional cold spell in winter, the pond freezes over and the kids can go ice skating, which they do. And uh, an arrangement like this allows us to study groups of monkeys in naturalistic settings where they can arrange themselves socially as they would in nature, in natural habitats. And in nature, rhesus monkeys l live in large social groups called troops. Actually, the troops can range in size between 30 or 40 individuals, up to several, on the small end, up to several hundred on the large end, but whether they're large or small, they all have the same basic social structure. Every troop is organized around several female-headed multi-generational families or matrilines. So these families can be four or more generations. Here's one of them. There's a mother, newborn infant, grandmother's back there. This is a older sister of the infant. This is a younger sister of the mother. So each troop will have several of these families. The other thing that's important to know about rhesus monkey social organization is within every group there are multiple dominance hierarchies. Um, and these are very important aspects of these monkeys' social life. There is a hierarchy between families such that every member of the highest ranking family, including infants, outranks everybody in the next highest ranking family, including adults. And, and these distinctions are quite sharp. Uh, so you see situations where infants from high ranking families can be stumbling along the trail, and adults from low ranking families will be falling all over themselves to get out of the way of these little kids because they know if they cause these kids any grief, the rest of that high-ranking family is going to be on their back in no time at all. There's a separate hierarchy within each family. The basic rule is younger daughters outrank older daughters. There's a separate hierarchy for the males that come into a troop. I neglected to say that this social arrangement derives from the fact that females stay in the group in which they're born for their entire lives, whereas males stay only until puberty. Then they leave one way or another, they hang out in all-male gangs for anywhere from several months to a year, and then they try to work their way into a new troop. So every troop has a plenty of adult males and females in it, but the females have all been there since birth, and they're all related to one another, at least within their respective groups, whereas the males have been there only since puberty, and initially they're related to no one until they start having offspring of their own. So in these multiple hierarchies, there's a hierarchy among the males that come into a troop, that's roughly related to tenure. That is how long a male has been in the troop. But of course, it's not tenure or length of time that's important. What's really important is how good those males are at making friends and sustaining alliances, not only with other males, but especially with high-ranking females who carry the real clout in the troop. And males that are good at this stick around and, and uh, move up their hierarchy, and males that are not so good usually give up and leave and seek their fortune elsewhere. And then finally, there's a hierarchy among the infants that are born into a troop every year, usually at the same time each year because these are seasonal breeders. And it's not that some infants are bigger or stronger or quicker or smarter than other infants. Those individual differences undoubtedly exist. It's that other monkeys associate a particular infant with a particular mother and afford it right from the beginning equivalent social status. And I'll get back to this point later in the talk. So life is a pretty complicated, can be a pretty complicated business for monkeys living in this kind of a social arrangement. And for them to be able to thrive in these groups, uh, uh, just survival might be enough, they have to acquire a great deal of information, not only in the, uh, develop a complicated social repertory of their own, but they also have to get a great info, bit of information about others in the troop. Who's related to whom? Where does every individual fit in these respective hierarchies? as well as recent social history. Who's been getting into fights recently? 
who can you count on to back you up if you get into a fight yourself? And monkeys that are able to assimilate this information and follow the rules inherent in these dominance hierarchies do very well in this complicated situation. Monkeys who are either unwilling or unable to usually don't survive in the wild. So we know quite a bit about early development. Uh, maybe 50 years worth of research has contributed to this. And we now know that in the wild and in most laboratory facilities, including mine at Poolsville, rhesus monkey infants spend virtually all of their first month of life in intimate physical contact with their mother. By the way, they grow up about four times faster than we do, which is an enormous advantage for those of us who are interested in uh, long-term effects of early experience or lifespan development or transmission of characteristics from one generation to the next because we can see a generation in four or five years instead of having to wait 15 or 20 for the human equivalent. So when I give you an age in rhesus monkey months or years, just multiply it by four and you'll get a rough human equivalent. But anyway, rhesus monkeys spend this first month of life in almost continuous physical contact with their mother. And during this time, a strong and enduring attachment bond is established between mother and infant. It's a, exactly the kind of bond that Bowlby uh, described for human infants it's function that you see in virtually every culture in the world. It's functionally equivalent. Um, and um, so Bowlby argued w using data from monkey species f f that this represent the product of evolution. It had long been selected for, and you'll see it in most of the higher primates, this strong mother-infant bond. As Bobby described, these monkey infants, as earlier their second month of life, start leaving their mothers for short periods of time to begin to explore their environment. And they use their mother as a secure base for these exploratory forays. And these forays become more frequent, involve greater distances and more amounts of time away from the mother as they get older. So that by six months of age, these youngsters are spending only about 20% of their waking hours in actual physical contact with their mother. But the mothers, as opposed to the 100% that they spent in that fir first month, yet the mother's presence in the immediate environment is absolutely crucial to sustain this early exploration because, as Bowlby taught us, monkeys, who, uh, individuals who lose access to their secure base, rapidly lose any motivation to do any more exploration. So who do these monkeys, youngsters, spend their time with if they're not spending it with their mother? Well, to an increasing extent, they're spending it with peers. I mentioned rhesus monkeys are seasonal breeders, so all of the infants are born within a two to three month period every year. And what this guarantees is that the youngster growing up will have plenty of other youngsters in the troop who are about the same age and who have about the same physical and cognitive and social capabilities as themselves, and that's who they choose to hang out with. These monkeys, during the childhood years, the rest of the first year of life, the second year of life, and the third year of life will spend several hours every day in active social play with their peers. And it's in the context of this play that virtually every behavior pattern that's going to become important for normal adult functioning can be developed and practiced and perfected long before it has to become actually functional. And this is especially true for, for reproductive behavior, and it's also especially true for the socialization of aggression that comes into their repertory uh, at between four and six months of age. And very nice perspective studies, both a long time ago by my mentor Harlow and more recent work, has shown pretty convincingly that mon monkeys who are otherwise well socialized but denied opportunities to play with peers when they are growing up inevitably grow up to have problems with reproduction and real problems controlling aggression. Now, not all monkeys in a place in the wild or in a place like Poolsville grow up this way because some of them have mothers that are neglectful and abusive. They are maltreating maybe 10% of the population in most, most field studies. And these, this uh, abuse is episodic and infrequent but it, and, and acute, whereas the neglect is more chronic. And monkey infants who grow up with these kind of mothers grow up with particular characteristics. They explore less. Uh, they actually spend more time trying to contact their mother than those under normal circumstances. And if you know the abuse literature, in many cases, children who have been abused or neglected make e extra efforts to try to establish relationships with their mothers. And monkeys are the same way. They also become more fearful as they get older. And they have higher levels, at least in the first two years of life, of cortisol, chronic cortisol uh, measured through hair. Uh, relative 